Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 250 of the Running Thrill podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited you are here. 250 episodes. I mean, that's kind of hard to believe, actually, because uh, it feels like I should only be on like 85. And uh, but then on the other hand, it feels like I've been doing this for 20 years. So I don't know. It's one of those strange, strange feelings. But I'm excited that we are at episode 250. And those of you who have listened to every episode, thank you. I can't even put into words how amazing that is because I know that we all feel totally overwhelmed. Even some of my favorite shows, I have just fallen off the wagon, not been able to get anywhere near all of them. And so if you've managed 250, I mean, serious well done to you. And I appreciate you so much. But even if you haven't made all 250, I am really thankful to you for being a loyal listener. If this is your first time listening, welcome. I hope there are many more ahead. Although I just want to say, don't beat yourself up if you can't get to episodes. Or if I do say, what did you think of this 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 conversation and you don't get a chance to listen to it, it's okay. I mean, I, I, everyone's putting so much pressure on us to uh, be everything for everyone else. And, and I think sometimes we need to look after ourselves. So if you haven't listened to everyone, I understand, but you got to do what's best for you. All right. So on to today, I thought I would go back to more of a traditional running for real episode from, you know, maybe a hundred, 150 episodes ago. And as marathons and full races are starting to come onto the scene again and feel like they may well go ahead. Uh, I thought we could have someone on who could talk about uh, training for and preparing for a marathon. And I know there's hundreds of books on on training for races and particularly for marathons. Um, but my guest today, I wanted to bring on because what he has created here is so different and so easy to read that it just, I was so impressed. I keep saying so, I apologize. I was really impressed by just what he was able to create here, the advice he was able to get from some experts. You're going to hear a bit more about it, but we also talk about him in general and what he's been up to. I'm really thankful for um, the friendship uh, my guest today, Matthew Huff, and I have created, and he's just a great person to learn from. And I think the community could really benefit from some of the advice we talk about. We also do talk about, you know, some of the more real things with writing a book like imposter syndrome and how scary it was to call up some of the best known names in running and ask them for their advice, but also wanting to make an impression on them. Um, We talk more about beyond the running itself and how uh, our own insecurities and self-doubt can get us in trouble sometimes. And we do discuss about being overwhelmed with podcasts and just what I was talking about a moment ago there, that um, everyone is vying for our attention and it feels a bit much that sometimes we need to step away. So I'm excited to introduce you to Matthew Huff. He is author of Marathoner, What to Expect When Training for and Running a Marathon. He also writes for many of the publications you may know and love, including uh, BuzzFeed and Runner's World. And he quite often does the uh, music and podcast section of those magazines uh, or or those write-ups about uh, what we should be listening to. So you may well have come across one of his playlists. Now, this one is a bit more fun, a bit more like an old school running for real episode, but I thought it was a nice change up. So without any further ado, let's thank one of our sponsors and get right to this episode with Matthew Huff. 
Thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am so appreciative of this company, not just for the products they create, not just for the time they put into getting the NSF certification or the informed sport badge on their website with their products, not just the ingredients that they carefully select for each of their products, which I've talked about. I've told you about how much brain drive helps me to stay focused and stay on task. I've talked about the uh, performance creatine, how that helps me to recover from strength training workouts i have talked about the collagen that is useful for recovery in general as a runner and elite sleep for when i'm having a tough time falling asleep it is a wonderful product to make sure there are no hangover ish side effects in the morning when you wake up but today i want to tell you a bit about a challenge that momentous is doing it's actually already started but you can still go sign up And um, they are doing a consistency challenge, which uh, started on May 24th. By signing up, you will, uh, anyone who completes the challenge is going to be given uh, $25 off a momentous uh, order. So that will include sample packs of their protein, collagen, a blender bottle, special to the challenge. You will also be entered into a raffle to win a year's supply of Momentous products. And the link you can go to to sign up, I will put a link in the show notes for you to go sign up if you haven't already. It's called the Committed to Consistency Challenge. And it is a two week challenge that they are doing to just help us to do at least three workouts per week of any kind. And I have a feeling that most of you will be able to handle that and will probably have already have done that. So be sure to go to the uh, Momentous website um, or the, it's actually a Strava link link to the momentous challenge i will put a link in the show notes to go check that out so be sure to go do that and i want to thank momentous once again you can use code tina for 20 percent off your order at livemomentous.com they are a wonderful company they are doing awesome things i mean that challenge for most of you should be no problem whatsoever and yet from there you can get 25 dollars off any order over $35 and you can enter to win a year's supply of Momentous products, which is pretty cool. Go to livemomentous.com and use code TINA to check out the products and get yourself some right now. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am excited you are here and we are doing this. Thank you so much. I know. Thank you so much for having me. I've been you know, I've listened to your podcast for a while now, and I'm so excited to finally be on here. I feel like a celebrity. <laughs> you are in many ways. Um, I would imagine many of our listeners would have read your some of your articles, articles on Runner's World. Maybe some of them have a copy of your new book, which I'm excited about for you, Marathoner, What to Expect When Training for and Running a Marathon. And yeah, they may have just seen you around. So um, I'm excited that you are here. and. Um, I thought that we could make this episode more of a like traditional running podcast episode. Uh, Marathons are starting to happen, or at least they're intending to go ahead. There may be Mm -hmm. some people thinking about a first time marathon or marathoners who, you know, haven't done one in a few years and have some lessons that they need to learn again, as we as runners seem to quite often need to make the same mistake again and again to drill it in. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, So a goal of today is to get people excited again, maybe learn some new things, but we are also going to cover some other things and go off on different tangents as always. Um, I want to start with what you do outside of that, which I mentioned about writing for Runner's World. Uh, So quite often you've written about a whole um, selection of different topics on Runner's World, but you quite often share about running podcasts and music to, to run to among your other things. I would love for you to know, because I am certainly feeling this and it feels bad for me to say as a podcaster, but do you feel overwhelmed by podcasts right now? I know I should not be saying this myself, but (laughs) they're having a moment, but there are so many that I feel like I can't even keep up with my favorite ones. So as someone who writes about it, do you ever feel like analysis paralysis that there's so many things you want to hear from, you just don't know where to begin? You know, I sort of do. And I feel like especially in the pandemic, I 
sort of a lot of the time that I would traditionally spend listening to podcasts, whether like on a commute or, you know, like eating at a restaurant by myself during my lunch break. Now I'm just kind of at home. So I I feel like while more and more people have had time to start podcasts in the pandemic, like I personally have had sort of less time to listen Mm -hmm. to them, um, which is I... I just keep, da- I love podcasts so much and, and I have so many favorites. And so I just keep downloading the episodes and I'm like, okay, at some point I'll get to these. At some point I'll get to these. And then I was looking through my <laughs> sort of queue the other day and I realized that there's one podcast that I have 70 some episodes to that I haven't listened to. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh, like I, I desperately want to listen to all of these, but mm-hmm. like, will I, at a certain point, do I just have to sort of like cut bait and delete them? But I refuse mm-hmm. to do that. So I'll be like 84 years old, still trying to catch up on the pandemic podcasts. Um, but yeah, there are there are a lot. Podcasts are definitely having a moment. But I also feel like, and I'm sure that you have noticed this as well, that lots of people start podcasts and then they t- t- don't tend to mm-hmm. last for very long. So I think there's always a little bit of a war of attrition in the podcast space of like, okay, there's a lot of people starting them, especially you know, more celebrity-ish type people. And then at a certain point, they maybe like fall off a little bit. And then, you know, the tried and true podcasters shall remain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I could see that in, in a lot of ways for sure. Especially if they've started with this unsustainable cadence of, of multiple a week that is just yeah. not going to happen when schedules get back busy again. Well, I think people think that podcasts are really easy because it's just talking. So they're like, oh, uh-huh. like I can I can talk for an hour. Like, how hard is that? And then they don't realize all of the work that goes into podcasts behind the scenes of like uh, booking guests and, and doing all of the research and preparing questions and notes and then all of the editing and the marketing and the branding. I mean, it's like so, there's so much that goes into a mm-hmm. single podcast. And if you think that you're getting into it because it's like an easy way to make a quick buck, it's like, I think you might be in biting off more than you can chew. Sure. Yeah, it's funny, actually, when you were saying about um, the sheer amount that you have in your queue right now. And yeah, a lot of them are people who, you know, maybe we've always wanted to hear from like, you know, someone like Barack Obama having a Mm -hmm. podcast, like how cool is that? Um, But yeah, it'll yeah. be interesting to see um, what like what keeps going. And I feel like I'm doing the opposite. It's like I'll download things and then I'll be like, all right, I've got to listen to that one soon. And then it'll get pushed down and then I'll be like, I've got to listen to this one soon. And then eventually it's been like six weeks and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, you're being cut. Uh, and then it will just get kicked off. Yeah. I tend to keep mine at only like four or five. But then I, in my life, feel like I'm very much that way. And I, I'd, lo- I'd love your answer here, but I tend to like get rid of things way too easily and it drives my husband crazy. Um, but I wonder if there's something about that. Like, do you, are you a sentimental person who keeps a lot of things? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I, I, I guess I wouldn't think of myself necessarily in those terms, Um, but I will say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a big reader and a writer and I feel like those sort of go hand in hand and I've worked in publishing for a while. So I have so many books and I, you know, it takes a, a, a good chunk of time in order to read a book. And my apartment is just full of them. I have (laughs) like shelves and shelves and shelves of them that are at home at my parents' house in Michigan. You know, at some point I'm like, oh, I'll be super rich and live in a giant mansion that can just like have a library (laughs) that's multiple stories tall. But I, I am like very rare to get rid of a book. Like if somebody gives me one and in publishing, you know, it's like you get free books all the time from everybody Uh and their mother. And I'm still like, you know, holding on to these books that I got from a lunch in like 2015 that I fully know I will never read. And yet here they still are. And I think like, oh, well maybe someday. So Uh maybe I am more of a hoarder than I think I am. I think that's actually smart in a lot of ways because I recently was like, oh, where's that book that I got sent from about this topic? I can't even remember what the topic was. And I was like, oh, I got rid of that. I thought I'd never need it. And now I actually would love to have it. So I think Mm -hmm. actually you've got it right. But yeah, the space is a thing. I'm envisioning like in Beauty and the Beast, 
how she goes into yes. the library. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you want the ladder and everything that you can climb up and, you know, uh, swing around the room on your ladder. Is that what you're envisioning? Yes. But then just imagine that she took all of those books and moved into a New York tiny apartment and was just <laughs> like, I'm keeping them all. I'm not getting rid of a single one. So there's just like piles everywhere. Yeah, I, I definitely have have that as well going on in my house. Okay, mm-hmm. getting back on track. Um, do you do you have any advice for someone who, that, because you are listening to these podcasts and you are writing um, stories about like which ones to listen to, do you have any uh, uh, advice for us on how to choose which one to go for? As far as like running podcasts go or just like podcasts in general? Or just, I guess, in general, either way. I mean, I really think that especially when there's so many, you just really have to focus on the things that you're most interested in. One thing I love about podcasts is that there are people who can go so deep and so specific on such niche topics. And with like books or TV shows or movies, like there's a barrier to entry there of the production where Mm -hmm. like not everybody can write a book, not everybody can make a TV show about a topic. But if there's a topic that you're really passionate about, you can probably find one other person who's passionate about that and make a podcast about it. And so then you just have like hours and hours and hours of content on these like very niche things. So Mm -hmm. I find that the podcasts that I am most drawn to and come back to over and over again are the ones that are about like the really specific things that maybe my friends aren't as interested in as I am. Like one topic that I love that isn't running related at all, but is like, um, like movie award season, like the Oscars and such. And so there's a bunch of podcasts that I listen to that are like very specifically there throughout the year about like what movies they think are going to be big and what movies do they think are going to get nominated for which awards and it's just such like a it's such a weird little subsection of the internet but here (laughs) I can listen to like hours of these very educated film journalists talk about you know what is going to win the best uh, you know documentary short subject Oscar and I'm fascinated by that because if I go to any of my friends in daily life and I'm like so what do you think about this they're gonna be like uh, you're weird like stop talking to us so <laughs> so but I think that's great with running podcasts too because a lot of people I mean myself included like I love running I, I mean I've written I write about it all the time and I have friends who are runners but I also have lots of friends who aren't runners and so it's nice to sort of feel like oh like I'm in this little niche or family when mm-hmm. I get to listen to these podcasts and hear about other people who are passionate about the same things that I am even if the people in my regular life aren't yeah yeah I agree with that that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that that is cool and that is one of the good things about podcasts with the specific yeah you can find a topic on anything and uh find other people who love it as much as you do so yeah i think that's definitely a good one Mm -hmm. okay what about music um how do you decide which songs to include oh music is tricky um uh so it's it's actually sort of funny that i do the playlist for runner's world because most of my friends say that i have terrible taste in music um (laughs) i Uh, like they make fun of me all the time. We were up, um, I was with a couple of friends for Thanksgiving this past year and we were sort of like taking turns putting on playlists while, you know, we were cooking dinner or whatever. And so I put on mine and probably like, I don't know, four songs into it. They're like, yeah, we got to turn this off. Like somebody else has to pick the music out for this because you are not like qualified. And then, and now I'm writing the Runner's World playlist. Um, (laughs) So... Yeah, I mean, I feel like music is such a subjective thing. It's like everybody likes stuff that's different. You can't really explain why you like a song or don't like a song. Um, So I just kind of like go with my gut. And when it comes to the Runner's World playlist, I try to... um, pick thing like I try not to wander off the beaten path too too much because I know mm-hmm. that I can uh pick some weird stuff that people are gonna be like what is this so in general with that I I try to like look at whatever the theme is for the month so like I think one that we did recently was like classic rock and so I just like listened to a bunch of classic rock music like sort of picked out songs that I really liked picked out songs that you know other people seem to like that I thought were would be good for running because you kind of want 
up-tempo stuff, I think, mostly mm-hmm. when you're trying to put together a running playlist. And then You just- mean My Heart Will Go On isn't a good running song? <laughs> I mean, to each their own, honestly, because... <laughs> Some people, like, I mean, I have a friend who, who like likes listening to more like, um, I, like, uh, like, I guess like elevator music almost, or like sort of smooth jazz mm-hmm. or whatever when they run, because they're like, oh, this is so peaceful. And, you know, you can just sort of get like mm-hmm. lost in your thoughts. And I'm like, oh, never have I ever, when I was running, think like, oh, smooth jazz, that's what I need. I'm like, we gotta, like, I need something with a beat. I need something that's gonna get me up and running, not like maybe put me to sleep halfway through it. So yeah, putting together a a running playlist, I feel like it's very subjective, but also very rewarding when you can find, when you get one that is like really works for you. And then you just like know that it's your go-to. So I don't know. Do you have particular artists that you uh, end up like returning to over and over? I mean, I, I I haven't run with music in quite a long time, actually, so I can't oh. answer that specific. I used to. I actually mm-hmm. used to rely on Disney when I was having oh. a bit of a tough time. Mm-hmm. That was my my go to to just kind of pep myself back up. But um, I mean, and I, I I do love the fact that Spotify, I can just you know have a a station on, and I can a song comes on, I'm like, oh, this would be good, and I've got you know my playlists. Mm-hmm. Uh, various playlists and then I can just add it to those various playlists as I as I hear the song Mm -hmm. so I really like that I can do that now so I don't really have specifics um and actually this is gonna have already come out when no it won't have come out uh I actually got asked to write um for running global running day a um my favorite song to run to um, so Ultra is putting out a playlist, but I can't say what it is because this is going to come out before that. <laughs> so The um, mystery. Yeah. So everyone can see what my song of choice is, which I guarantee you haven't heard of. Or okay. I would be surprised if you had heard of it. I'm sure um, I haven't. I don't have that good of taste <laughs> in music. An Engli- it's an English band and a very cheesy poppy one. So, um, yeah. But no, um, do you have, I know you just said uh, uh, music is subjective. Can you give the listeners maybe three songs that you would that you think are some of the best ones you come across for running? Oh yeah, I mean, so I'm a big Beyonce fan, and I mm. feel like a lot of her stuff is really good. Like "Countdown" by Beyonce has such a good beat, and is just like such a fun, energetic song. I used to live in Pittsburgh, and I would sort of like time that song on my playlist to when. Pittsburgh has lots of hills. And so Mm -hmm. like there was one big hill that was usually on my running route. And I was like, okay, I need that song for the hill. And I like get in the rhythm and just like pound it out. Um, So that's really good. What have I been listening to recently? Um, I really like, see, this is my bad taste, but I really like Allie and AJ who like used to be Disney Channel stars. (laughs) And and now I just came out with a new album. Did they? Yeah, yes. So I've That's been listening funny. to that a lot. And yeah, I also like Coldplay a lot. And mm. they have a new song that came out um, called Higher Power that's also kind of uh, pumpy. So mm. I would say that. But again, see, like I'm just exposing my bad taste right here with uh, Coldplay and I don't and think Allie you can do it. Do not put Coldplay in a, in a in a box of bad taste. Absolutely not. I love Coldplay so much. Um, yeah. I yes, they are they are one of my favorite bands. I've been a fan of them ever since I was a little kid. So, can I, you ever listen to Fix You without crying? Um, you I know, I feel like I cry every time. It it if it sort of like shows up someplace and it hits me out of uh, left field, then sometimes I can get through it. But yeah, if I'm in a mood and I choose to listen to Fix mm. You, then I'm definitely you want to cry. Yes, yeah. then I'm in a weepy place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do have a few songs that I'm just like I need to cry. I'm gonna put and that's one of them. I'm mm-hmm. gonna put the song on. I know I'll get it out of my system. The other one is <laughs> Enrique and Great Inglesius. Uh, he- <laughs> hero (laughs) another Um, good one if you've ever watched the video of that he he dies in it and so it's really like horrifying to watch wait how does he die well maybe he doesn't die but the somebody the main man in it dies (laughs) i can't remember if it was him no no, it's horrible to watch it's really i'm like getting upset thinking about it but yeah (laughs) and uh, yeah it's like the sarah mclaughlin um like the sad dog video song 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I need to get us back on track yeah. here. Um, <laughs> so uh, you, I mentioned your book, Marathoner, What to mm-hmm. Expect When Training for and Running a Marathon. Um, it's not exactly the time you would maybe have pictured when you thought about uh, maybe publishing a book someday, yes. uh, being a global pandemic. So we see people on book tours not in the non-COVID times Mm -hmm. and it looks glamorous it looks like you know you're traveling the world people fans are lining up for you blah 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 but you often hear from um the writers that actually it's pretty stressful really isolating and lonely Mm -hmm. so do you think you would have preferred that intense traveling schedule or do you like the way that it has been that you could do a lot of it from the comfort of you know where you live yeah um I don't know if my book would ever have had a super big traveling schedule just Mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, like I'm not a super well-established author. Um, But I do, I do feel like had that we had they we not been in a pandemic, there would have been more book events. I would have probably mm-hmm. done a couple of signings and then also marathons would have been in full force. So I can imagine that I would have gone to some race expos and sat there and chatted with people and signed copies. Mm-hmm. And I'm a pretty extroverted person in general. So I think I would have had a lot of fun with that. Um, I'm sure it would have been draining after a certain point, mm-hmm. but but yeah, I don't know. I we'll kind of see how marathons open up in the fall if they do, because I will. I imagine that I'll probably end up doing some of the things that I would have done when the book launched had it not been the pandemic this fall, when you know marathons are up and running and people are back to sort of usual in their running life. Um, so I don't know. I will keep you posted on whether or not I get drained from that when it happens. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast and being a longtime supporter and friend of mine. Athletic Greens is an well, it's, they have their ultimate daily all-in-one supplement with 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients that work together to help the body absorb and synthesize these nutrients in a highly bioavailable form. I have it each and every morning. If you've been doing the Together Runs with me, you will notice that when I ask the question of what do you taste, I quite often say Athletic Greens because I literally drink it right as I am going out the door. I am going to be sneezing, friends, but rather than this being real, oh no, I think it's gone away. Yep, it has. (laughs) I want to keep this in just because this is running for real. Definitely felt like I was about to sneeze there. Anyway, yes, so quite often I will say in the mornings on my Together Runs that I taste Athletic Greens because I do drink it before I go out the door. It is, you know, doesn't upset my stomach. I'd love starting off the day knowing that I'm get all those really hard to find ingredients and nutrients that I probably wouldn't get in my diet otherwise. It is an amazing insurance policy for um, your body. Um, it's just a comprehensive approach to nutritional support. It can replace your multivitamin and mean that you don't have to take 27 different tablets every morning. Um, elite and professional athletes use it as well as just health conscious go-getters. It makes it really easy for you to get everything you need without putting all the complication in it. Um, There are so many helpful effects from from taking it. I have adaptogens that help maintain hormone levels, support mood. Magnesium will help you with muscle soreness. Your digestion will feel supported whether you are at home or now you are starting to travel. There's a peace of mind um, that comes with this that I've mentioned already. And my friends, I I always forget to mention this, but if you live in Europe or you live in Canada, you can get the same deal and the same option that I am offering to my American listeners. So you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. And yes, if you are in Europe or in Canada, you can also get the one year free supply of vitamin D3, uh, K2. And it's not going to be a... um, 
an additional customs charge or that it, it, they do have bases in those countries. So if you've been hearing this for years and thinking about it, this is for you too. So pay attention. I really uh, I love my Athletic Greens. And I want to say I mix it with ice fridge cold water. I really think that makes a huge difference. Um, and I enjoy drinking it. I really do. And yes, I will say it does take a moment to get used to, but if you use the ice cold water, it makes a big difference. So go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina and get your Athletic Greens today. I imagine that I'll probably end up doing some of the things that I would have done when the book launched had it not been the pandemic this fall when, you know, marathons are up and running and people are back to sort of usual in their running life. Um, so I don't know. I will keep you posted on whether or not I get drained from that when it happens. Well, maybe I'll see you at an event and you'll be like, hey. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll be like, like, all the life has gone out with you. I'll be like, please get me a coffee. <laughs> Take me away from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I promise if I see you and you look like that, I will take your hand and, and stow you away <laughs> in a, in a hotel and say that I lost you. <laughs> yes. You Thank you. Out. Much appreciated. <laughs> okay. Um, why do you think, why was this book needed? So for someone listening, who's saying, okay, there's like 375 books about the marathon. Why is this one different? What would you say? Yeah. So sort of the whole idea behind this was that there are a lot of running books, which I have read and which I love. Um, and usually they sort of fall into one of two camps. They're either like a hardcore training manual, you know, with this is how many reps you're supposed to do. This is how far you're supposed to run. This is what you're supposed to eat. And sort of a I feel like those are usually kind of ugly books with just like lots of graphs and charts and and not a lot of interesting things going on. And then the other alternative is you get a lot of memoirs by people who have who are either famous runners or you know have had interesting lives connected to running and so they write these like really interesting books that are about sort of themselves and running. And while I really enjoy both of those um the publisher of, of Marathoner was like, hey, there's all of these people who run marathons or want to run marathons or, you know, or just runners in general. And the marathon is such a strange, interesting, unique sport and the culture surrounding it and the people who do it are so are so specific. And there's really not a book that, you know, like celebrates them, that celebrates the race, that celebrates the people who run it. And so they came up with the idea to do a book that was illustrated with lots of pictures and graphics and, and charts in full color that also has a lot of information about the marathon and, and a lot of training advice, but also history and fun facts and running vocabulary and just all kinds of interesting tidbits and and things that are about the marathon marathon culture about the sport about the history of it and sort of told in a very fun like approachable interesting way that's mm -hmm. less of a book like that you would necessarily uh you know like use as a like step-by-step -step guide to training for a marathon, but more of like a, this is what this culture is like. Like this is mm. being a marathoner means all of these different things. And this book is sort of here to like welcome you into that world and show you all of the exciting, beautiful, crazy parts of it. Um, because I think it is very unique in, in the general uh, realm of sports. Yeah. And I think it's kind of like a, a crash course in, yeah, in, mm -hmm. in marathoning. Like there's, I just love the way that you've broken it down. You've given people insights into things so then they could potentially know to avoid those. Although, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning, sometimes we have to make our own mistakes to, right. <laughs> to learn them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it's basically all the questions you could ever have. And it, I, it's absolutely beautiful. And, um, uh, just so full of life, as you said, compared to other other books on this topic. 
And, uh, and you know, there's lots of graphics and images, so you didn't really have to do any work at all, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I thought. <laughs> the, um, the team at Rizzoli, who is the publisher, they do the most beautiful, immaculate books. Um, mm-hmm. You know, this is, this is sort of a, I mean, it's like a little smaller and, and like a fun guide, but they also do like giant, massive, like coffee table art books and things. So I knew when this was going to be an illustrated and, um, you know, designed book that it was going to be very beautiful. And I sort of thought like, oh, I'll mail in the text of it. And then, you know, 10 months later or whatever, I'll get a copy in the mail that has all the pictures and things. But I guess if I had thought this through, um, like the people who are work at the publisher, while they are great designers, are not marathon runners for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so they really needed me to be like, help them figure out the pictures, help them figure out the illustrations. Because when I say like, oh, um, you know, uh, like this is what someone would look like in mile 23 or, oh, uh, like we need stuff like pictures from an aid station. They don't necessarily know what that looks like or what that would look like in a race. And so it turned out that I had to do a lot of, like I had to comb through all of these um race photos we there was a photographer who has done marathon and just like race photos in general for years and so he sent us his database and i just basically went through like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures Mm -hmm. to pick out the ones that were in the book which was super fun and i'm so thankful that i got to do it because it was a it was a very like interesting task but not necessarily one that i had thought up originally and then, you know, as we're picking out pictures, we'd find something and it's like, oh, shoot, like this picture's really great. But you can see on the lady's bib that it says half marathon, not full marathon. Mm-hmm. So like we can't use that picture or um, or like with some of the illustrations that we had, there was an illust- I There's a section of the book that talks about um, like foods that they like strange foods that some marathons give out at their aid stations. And I ran the Vermont city marathon a couple of years ago, which I loved. And one of the things that they did that I thought was so cool is that they gave out popsicles, like at the, around like the mile 20, 22 mark, which I was like, this is genius because everyone's hot. And they're those Mm -hmm. ones that are sort of like in the plastic sleeve. So they're easy to hold on to. They're cool. They're easy to like suck out of the tube. I mean, they're really easier even than a gel because I feel like sometimes you're really like trying to squeeze that stuff out. Um, Mm -hmm. I was like, this is amazing. Like every marathon should give these out. So I wanted an illustration of that for the book. And I just said like, oh, popsicle illustration, sent it off to the illustrator. And then he came back with, you know, like, I don't know, like a bomb pop or whatever, like a popsicle on a stick. And I was like, uh, no, we'll need a different illustration. That's the ones in the sleeves. So yeah, I was, long story short, I was much more involved in the design process (laughs) than I was ever prepared to be. But I don't think that that, hindered the book in the long run so no it's my amazing poor design taste probably no 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 it's wonderful and actually it reminds me of like if anyone has ever made um a shutterfly book or a mm-hmm. vista print book where you like make a a book and you put all the embellishments and stuff it kind of makes me think of that the way that you've done it like just this when you stop to think about how many little things you would have had to do. It's a lot. And I just want to clarify to everyone listening that I already knew the answer to that. I wasn't being <laughs> really rude there. I, we'd already talked about this. So I thought um, it'd be a funny thing to bring up. Yeah. Okay. Another thing. Did you get imposter syndrome writing this book? Did you feel, you know, you've said that you're a writer, but like, I mean, this is a totally different thing. Um, being, you know, knowing that you, the future of people's marathons is in your hands. Yes. Oh, 100%. And really, when I started writing this book, I wasn't as much of a writer as I am now. So I guess to kind of like give a little bit of backstory on how the book came to be. Um, so I, you, I, I still work in publishing, but I used to work at an agency and I was an assistant there and I was running marathons at the time. And one way that books sometimes get published is that the publisher will decide, hey, we would really love a book about X. And then they'll go to agents and say, hey, can you find us an author who would want to write a book about this topic because we want to publish a book about it, which is great for the author because then they don't have to come up with the idea themselves. They can just, you know, write it and they already know that the publisher wants it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so they came to my agency and my agent, um, who wasn't my agent at the time, but just someone that I worked with, Danielle was like, Hey, we're looking for authors who would want to write this book about marathons. And so they found a woman named Bridget Quinn who, uh, had written for ESPN and had had a couple of other books and was also a big runner who decided, who they decided like that she would be a great author for this book. And, she was, she agreed to do it, but she was kind of busy. And so they brought me on sort of to help her write it. Cause they're like, Oh, this guy who works at the office, like also runs marathons and he's, you know, writes from time to time. So maybe he'd be helpful. And then just through a series of events, uh, I ended up being the the main writer of the book, which was so exciting, but also, yeah, like you said, very kind of daunting. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome because I felt like, okay, I, one, I, one, I interact with writers all the time and I know what a massive deal it is for someone to write and publish a book and that people work years and years and years to get to that point. And here I am sort of like handed a book awkwardly Mm -hmm. to write when, just because I'm in the right place at the right time. But then also within the running community, you know, there's, there's coaches and trainers and people who can run so much faster than I am. And so to feel like, oh, I'm writing a book about marathons for, yeah, potentially, you know, lots of people who have never run before to, uh, to follow sort of my guide that is very daunting. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's more qualified people than me to write this book. It was actually kind of funny. At one point when we were submitting it to publishers, one of them sort of came back to us and was like, yeah, we looked up, um, at this time it was Bridget and I who were writing it together. And they were like, we looked at their times and we don't think that they're fast enough runners to write this book. (laughs) So I was like, okay. Um, But I actually sort of think that one of the things that I love so much about marathon running and one of the reasons why I find it such a compelling sport is because I do feel like it is something for everybody And, um, you know, I was not a runner growing up. I'm not like an athletic person necessarily. I'm not a super sportsy person. And I had run a little bit here and there, but, uh, and I had run a half marathon, but I had always thought like, oh, I'll never run a marathon. And then I moved to New York city and a friend wanted to watch the marathon because in New York, basically the marathon shuts down the entire city for Mm -hmm. the day. So it's like, you can either watch it or you can stay at your house, but there's not really another option of things to do. So we went and saw it and I was just so like inspired and impressed by all of the different people who were running the race. Like it wasn't these, you know, very like six packy athletic thin runner people. I mean, there are those of course, but you know, there's people of all ages and backgrounds and shapes and sizes. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, this looks like so much fun. Everybody looks miserable, but they also look, uh, you know, euphoric at the end. And it's such a massive celebration and achievement. And I was like, I want to be a part of this. And so then I started running, but I think that, because the marathon is a sport that is for everybody. And hopefully a lot of the people who are reading this book will be people who, you know, are signing up for their first marathon or have just run their first marathon or who aren't people who would, you know, usually think of themselves as like professional athletes that hopefully by having someone who wrote it be also in that same category as them will make it feel a little bit more approachable and a little bit less of like, hello, I am, I can run a marathon in two hours. Let me tell you how you should run yours. And more of like, hey, look, this is going to be real difficult. And, but it's also going to be real awesome at the same time. And like, I'm going to give you some hints and tips, but also like, I'm here for you when this is miserable and you feel like quitting and you just got to get through it and you'll thank me later. So I don't know. So I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I, it still flares up every now and again, but I feel like I'm trying to push through it or, or accept that part, I guess. Thank you to Gooda for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. As I've mentioned before, it will be rare that you come across a day where I'm not wearing a pair of Goodas. I live in them. 
Uh, Bailey loves to put them on her head because she sees them con me constantly wearing them. And actually, to that point, Bailey is always wearing sunglasses and other people always comment on it. And I genuinely think that's because both Steve and I are always wearing sunglasses and almost always good as. Uh, he does have one other pair of sunglasses that he sometimes wear, but you will you will rarely come across a day that I'm not in good as. They are they don't bounce, they don't slip. They are polarized, they are fun, and they're affordable. Even before you add the discount I'm about to give you, they are $25 each for the, for the, uh, for the primary ones. Some of my favorites are a ginger's soul, which is just the, you know, black with black. Uh, I love the electric Dinotopia Carnival and the Mick and Keith's Midnight Ramble. Those are some of my favorite um, styles. And you go to the Gooder website, you'll see there are an unbelievable amount of good reviews because Gooders really are the best. You had me interview their CEO, Stephen Lease, on the podcast. So if you have any hesitations because of a certain pineapple gate a few years ago, go listen to that episode with Stephen Gooder. I asked uh, Stephen Gooder with Stephen Lease of Gooder. I asked him directly about that incident and I feel like it was very healing for a lot of people. So you can go to gooder.com, that's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash Tina, and that will take you straight to my page to show my favorite um, glasses, to give you the code automatically entered, or you can just use Tina15 as your code for 15% off your order by going to gooder.com. Yeah, I just love them. They're, they don't slip, they don't bounce, they're polarized, and they're fun. What more could you ask for? Go to gooder.com forward slash Tina. <laughs> I'm going to give you some hints and tips, but also like I'm here for you when this is miserable and you feel like quitting and you just got to get through it and you'll thank me later. So I don't know. So I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I, it still flares up every now and again, but I feel like I'm trying to push through it or, or accept that part, I guess. I actually really agree with you that people in general can resonate more with someone who is it isn't necessarily like your PR is two minutes from theirs but mm -hmm. I do feel in general the average running population struggles to relate to elite runners and even when I was running as an elite athlete I really I tried hard to connect and I tried to be as honest and open and vulnerable as I could but I could feel that like chasm between the between us because it is you know hard to take advice from someone who makes it look so easy even if it's not easy and now people are opening up a bit more saying that it isn't easy for everyone but i do feel like people really appreciate um it coming from someone who is you know like them and they can see themselves in so i actually think in many ways that's a much better way of doing it and i i love the fact that um you are that you know, representative and, and it will connect with people on a much deeper level. So I think that's really cool. And um, yeah, I'm just glad to see it. Do you have any suggestions for, not that maybe listeners will be handed, situ handed something on a platter, as we said, like you were offered the opportunity to do this book, but maybe there's something that they want to share about or talk about or um, just you know, put out into the world, but a feeling like, yeah, why would anyone want to listen to me when they could be learning from these elite athletes who can run it an hour faster than me? While they might not get the opportunity you did, what would you say to that person to, you know, embrace that, um, their own journey? Yeah. I mean, just as someone who is a writer and works in publishing and, um, you know, and, and has, and now has a book. I think that, you know, just sharing your story with people is so important in all of its different forms, whether that be like on social media or on a podcast or in, in, on a blog or in written form. Um, because yeah, I, I mean, I think that people in general tend to think that the problems or things that they're facing are very specific to them yes. and and it can be very very isolating and then once you realize that actually that's a very common or universal issue to have or something that you know a lot of people are working through or working to overcome it 
like destigmatizes whatever you're sort of struggling with. And it also gives you a big net of people who can, you know, encourage you and come beside you and say like, hey, look, we've been through the same thing. Mm-hmm. And and then also by sharing your story, you're in turn helping the next person down the down the yes. road. So yeah, I mean, writing about marathons isn't necessarily like as as life changing as a lot of things that you could be writing about or stories that you can be sharing. But yeah, I think always like sort of delegitimizing your own voice before you even start speaking is something that, um, you know, is a real trap that I think, uh, it's, it's easy to fall into, but you have to, kind of push through it for yourself and also for other people because your story can, you know, sharing your story doesn't only help you. I think in a lot of ways it helps other people and maybe even helps them more than it helps you. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that's just important to mention. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, you have a lot of uh, quotes and interviews and um, sections featuring some of the best marathoners in the US and even the world. Lots of well-known names. Um, Was that intimidating to interview them, knowing that you were going to represent them and you wanted to do a good job and and even just, you know, the idea of speaking to them in general? Um, Yeah. So tell us about that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think I knew very early on in the writing process of this book that if I wanted this to do well or for people to sort of be interested in it, I needed to have some other names attached to the project aside from just mine because nobody would recognize me. But, um, <laughs> but you know, and, and also there's so much knowledge to be had in the running world in general beyond just what I know. So I interviewed lots of people, um, you know, from like Shalane Flanagan and Des Linden to this woman who ran the London Marathon dressed in a panda costume um, yeah. to this man who um, is a juggler, which is like you juggle while you run mm-hmm. marathons, which is crazy. Is he, wait, wait, wait. Is he in Michigan? He lives in Canada. Oh, okay. Because I, I was in a Michigan race once in Charlevoix, I think. And uh, there was a juggling man running. There are actually... A it's lot a of, uh, it's a big network of people who juggle, which I did not realize, but I was talking to him and there's like juggling rivalries. There <laughs> are, there, you know, there's a whole web of, of a whole network of people who are doing this, which was very fascinating. Mm. And that's the thing I love about marathons. It's like you get all of these different kinds of people who are doing all kinds of different things. Mm. But, um, but to answer your question, yes, I was very intimidated when I was talking to these elite runners because I'm like, oh my gosh. I've, you know, followed you, I've read about you, I've watched clips of you running these races, and now I'm talking to you. Um, And yeah, it is sort of, it's intimidating. And you're like, I want to ask you like thoughtful questions. And I don't want to seem like I'm stupid. And I want... Uh, you, but but I want I'm also trying to get like good information out of them for the book. So there was definitely a sort of a lot of a lot of um, juggling and sort of weirdly, I and en- I ended up interviewing the sort of bigger names I people I think earlier in the process. So I was even more nervous than I think I would have if I had interviewed them like later after I had you know interviewed some of the, you know, just more regular average people. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, it was very intimidating, but I'm so thankful that they were willing to talk with me after I just like sent them emails out of the blue. So which which I think again, speaks to the wonderful community in the running world that, you know, you can just send off an email to your favorite runner and they might respond. Although I don't want to get people's hopes up. Yes, well, uh, that's true. (laughs) <laughs> yeah thinking you can just find an email and expect a like 12 page reply yes um probably won't yeah. happen <laughs> it did take yes. a little hounding at some points yes i'm sure um although that is that is really cool to hear because um i i'd imagine it was tough in some ways as well because you probably wanted to like it's hard to quell that part of us that wants to make a good impression. Yes. And so you want to ask like an interesting and different question, but mm-hmm. with what you were doing, you obviously had to mostly probably go for the questions that they've been asked 
so many times before, but they're the things that people want to know about. Was that hard? Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely what I had to do. It's like, yeah, you want to ask something that's interesting or that's very specific, like, oh, what were you feeling at this mile on this race? But for the book, I knew that each of these interviews was only going to be a page or so. And so I really um, had to, yeah, hit the questions that were sort of the most obvious. And then also something that I found a little bit tricky with some of the elite runners is, so I'm writing this book, I'm trying to get advice from them for the re- the average runner, but sometimes the advice that they were giving me was advice that I think would be great advice if you were also like an elite runner, but mm. is not nece- was not necessarily super helpful if you were a, you know, like 40-year-old dad who's running his first marathon. So sometimes I kind of had to like, ask the same question in multiple different ways to kind of like get around to an answer that was useful in the end. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually remember at the beginning of uh, kind of when I was first being asked for interviews and doing things, you know, out uh, in the running community and people saying like asking me about how much calories to consume and how many gels. And Mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, you only need like two or three. And then I had to step back and be like, wait a minute. Like, yes, you may only need two or three, but like that if you tell people two or three and they're going to be out there six hours, like they're not going to, they're not going to, the body is going to start shutting down after a certain point because Mm -hmm. that's not enough. And, but it's something that, yeah, you have to be conscious of that thought, which I would imagine it, it is tough for some elite runners to get themselves out of that mindset when they're surrounded by those people. All the yes. Time. Yes. Someone mm. told me that, oh, for a half marathon, you don't really need to take in any fluids. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't put that in this book. Well, that's funny because I remember getting asked that specific question too, being like, oh, what fuel do you take in a half? And it being like, I actually don't have anything. <laughs> right. But like, I knew that that wasn't the answer. So I'd be like, <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> but you should have this. But then it sounds like you're doing the child thing of like, do what I say, not what I do. Right. Mm-hmm. No? So, but then you have to awkwardly be like, well, it's cause I'm kind of can get away with it. But like, yeah. So it's, I, I'd imagine that was tricky. <laughs> yeah. You're, it's like, if you're running a, a, a half marathon in like an hour and 20 minutes or whatever, that's very different than if you're running a half marathon in, um, you know, like two and a half hours. Yes. So. Sure. No, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Since I have um, stepped away from those days, I realize that it's actually much harder to be middle back of the pack because of the sheer amount of time you are out on your feet. Mm -hmm. Um, It's way tougher. Um, Okay. To wrap up a few things, what are some things that you learned about during writing this that you would like the listeners to know if, you know, they have signed up for a full marathon and and they really want to make the most of the opportunity? Hmm, that's a good question. I feel like the the most interesting things for me that I learned in this race, I think, are probably the behind the scenes stuff on how marathons are put together. Just like the sheer amount of organization and volunteers and infrastructure that's needed to put on a big road race, which I don't know if that's necessarily helpful to you know, first time marathoners, but I do think it's really reassuring to know that you are in very good hands. Like the, the race will be difficult for you and, you know, you are sort of struggling, but you are definitely not struggling alone in that there are so many medical support people and, um, you know, and security and people who've just really thought through everything from like where the aid stations are, where the water is, um, like how the path is going to, to work to sort of like best suit the runner. And it was, I, I, I was just sort of like agog at how much work goes into these races. And yeah, I think that just like knowing that does take a little bit of stress off of you mm. because you're you don't feel like, oh, it's you out on a training run and you have to like, you know, if something bad happens, it's just you. No, it's like in a marathon, especially, you know, like a big um city marathon, there is a lot of people there who are there to help you and really want you to succeed and do your best. Mm, so true. Uh, you know what that made me think of actually though. Imagine explaining to a non-runner that in many races, there is a tangent line, a line that 
takes you, you know, the shortest possible route. And that may be like, you know, cutting across, like if you were to follow mm-hmm. it and you were a middle of the pack person, you'd be just bumping into people all over the place. Uh-huh. But like, if you think about that, that's so funny that like, to a non-runner, they'd be like, uh, just run the road. Yeah. You know, like, mm-hmm. isn't that obvious? But like, we're so, the races are so, um, concerned about some people i mean of granted this is again the front of the pack but people running the absolute fastest to the second Mm -hmm. but they have created a line that takes you the most direct route over 26 miles yeah yeah it's Uh, it's it's fascinating (laughs) um okay next question would you obviously granted everyone is an individual person they have to think about themselves Mm -hmm. Would you say, based on what you've learned, that you would encourage people to start with a big one? Uh, you know, let's say they can get into the, they enter the lottery and they get of various big races and they get in. Or would you say that a small local one is, is preferable? Hmm. That is a good question. Uh, I would, so my first, I'm from Michigan. My first marathon was the Detroit Marathon, hmm. which I think is a fantastic race. Um, And one of the things that I loved about running it was that I have so many friends and family who were so excited to see me. And because it wasn't that far, they were out there and they were lined on the street. And because, I mean, Detroit's a big marathon, but it's also not massive. So it's like Mm -hmm. easy enough to get around that they could see me multiple times. And I think that encouragement is so key. And especially when it's your first time running and you don't, really realize how like powerful that's going to be. I think until you're actually in the race and you're feeling, you know, really crummy and it's mile 24 and then you see your family with these signs and whistles and bells and it just like gives you that added oomph you need. So I think picking a race where you're going to be able to have a lot of people that you know come out and cheer Mm -hmm. for you is really exciting. That being said, I also think big city races are great because there's a lot of people out there cheering, even whether they know you or not. And there's a lot of like interesting things going on. Um, I think the toughest parts of races are when it's sort of like the back half of the race, maybe the half marathoners are gone. There's not very many people out there. There's not very many fans and you just sort of have to like buckle down and do it. And that's rewarding in its own way. But I think if you're only going to run one marathon or if it's your first marathon, that having as much support as possible is great. So if you Mm -hmm. live in a small town and it's a small town marathon, but you know that you're going to have your friends and family out there cheering for you, I would say do that. If you live in a big city and you can get your friends there, all the better. Um, so I think it's really about the support more than anything, at least for yeah. me. Yeah, No, I, I agree with that. I, f- I feel very much the same way. Mm-hmm. And, and any other things you would say to consider when selecting a race? Uh, what other individual preferences should someone keep in mind? I mean, I think that something that people don't really think about very often uh, for first time races is like um, the travel component especially Mm -hmm. after the race, like you are beat after Mm -hmm. a marathon Mm -hmm. and there is truly nothing more miserable than, than getting in a car and like having to drive for four hours. Um, so I think like if a, if the race is on a Sunday, just like take the Monday off of work, spend the Sunday in the city where the race is like, you know, walk around, do your ice baths, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then do the travel the next day because, Traveling on the day of a marathon is terrible and Mm -hmm. it just makes you feel so bad for like the next three or four days because your body is so stiff. I ran the New Jersey marathon a couple of years ago and then took the train back to New York afterwards. And oh my gosh, terrible, terrible experience. (laughs) Don't do it. I did, uh, I got, uh, flew back from Boston the day after and, and not only was it a big stress to finish the race and literally Thankfully, I could, I had some friends that were in, and this is again, showing my privilege, but Mm -hmm. had some friends who were in the the host elite hotel and Uh I just went in there and showered and stuff. But, Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I literally had a quick shower, gave her a hug and then had to go straight to the airport. But the only thing, it wasn't enjoyable. The only thing that was, was actually 
<laughs> there was multiple other people who were doing the same thing. Oh, yeah. So you could just be like hobbling around mm-hmm. and you're like, Good job. like you all know what you're doing yes. and all the other people who haven't run are like, oh, did you run the marathon today? Whereas when I phoned back the next day, you kind of look like someone's beaten you up. <laughs> but then like people of people who live there have totally forgotten that the race yes. was the day before or don't care. And so they're like, why are they walking like that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but it's still worth it. Mm-hmm. Like, why is she limping and eating like a whole thing of uh, KFC chicken here at the airport? This is unusual behavior. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I love it. Thank you for the, that piece of advice. Very good. Mm. Um, anything else you would want to tell people, whether it's their first marathon or the first marathon back after a few years away? Anything you'd like to remind people? I mean, I think just to, uh, you know... For, I think for people coming back to the marathon, especially after the pandemic, there, because I felt this on myself, there's like a lot of pressure to, okay, I've been away from races. Now I'm going to come back. I'm going to hit a PR. I'm going to be the best I've ever been. Like now is my time to shine. And I think just like putting that pressure on yourself is not super helpful in a lot of ways. And especially since, you love running and you love marathoning and you haven't got to do it in a little while. I think just taking the first race and saying like, Hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to, you know, sort of like celebrate this thing that I haven't got to do in a while. And now I'm getting back into is a much more sort of healthy and enjoyable mindset than Mm -hmm. deciding that, you know, it's like, this fall, got to get that, you know, new yes. PR. Or otherwise, what has this pandemic been worth? Uh, which I think can be really frustrating and daunting. And then, and then if you don't get a PR, then you're going to feel really bad. And that's not how anyone should feel when they finish a race. So, yeah. I agree a oh, thousand percent. I, I really, really hope that most runners come out the other side of this pandemic just being able to appreciate being out there, like no matter what the result, Mm -hmm. um, having had that time away to like, you know, um, uh, if you love it, let it go kind of thing. Forced to let it go, but like had that time away and just be thankful to be out there, be enjoying it, no matter whether it's a good day or a bad day. Mm -hmm. I really hope, yeah, like you said, it doesn't become a case of like, I've missed out on two years of racing. I've got to like make up the time, Mm -hmm. you know? Because that's such a shame if that is the case, because Mm -hmm. it just someone who has tried for many years is not worth it. Promise. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, yeah. Anything else um, that you think people should you would like to say to people to go check out Marathoner? Where can they go get it um, and where can they go find you in the future? Yeah. um, So the book is available wherever books are sold. So. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, Burns and Noble. You can get it at your local bookstore. If they don't have it, they can definitely order a copy. Um, I also write for Runner's World and for BuzzFeed a good bit. So I um, always have articles there. Um, and if you follow me on Instagram, which is at HuffMatt, that's, like that's my main social media platform. So anything I'm doing, I, you know, I post there and you can, you know, follow all my shenanigans and my bad playlists and <laughs> whatever else people are I, I love having it. me do. I I think we should get to see the real do we get to see the real playlist or is this the one that the uh, socially acceptable one? Yeah. Well, so I did um I mean the socially acceptable ones will be making an appearance. Um <laughs> the I'm working on one right now for Runners World for June. So it's gonna be a pride playlist with all um mm. LGBTQ people uh on it, which I'm really excited about. But also I do I have posted just my random playlist before. So I think if you go through some of my story highlights, there's definitely one or two of my less socially acceptable playlists on there. If you want just like pure chaos for a run, uh, that might be an option. Yes. Well, thank you. We look forward to if this, uh, no, this will be a few days before the, um, your next, uh, playlist for June will come out, but I Mm -hmm. definitely encourage people to go check out that playlist and, um, and yeah, I want to thank you for joining me today and I encourage people to go check out Marathoner. 
Uh, thanks, Matt. I, I appreciate you. Yeah, this was so great. Thank you so much for having me on. It was so much fun chatting. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mis- mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in, in words, because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything. And I think it's really important that running for real stays that way. So thank you to Jeremy for your work. I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore, who are also part of my team. They've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand. So just want to give them a shout out too. All right, let's get right back to the end of this episode. Thanks so much for joining me today in this conversation with Matthew. And I hope you will consider going to check out his book, particularly if it is your first marathon coming up in the fall or if you feel a bit rusty. It's really a beautiful book. I enjoyed thoroughly reading through it and I will be reading through it again next time I am preparing for a road marathon. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. You can go to livemomentous.com to get that 20% off Momentous. They are doing some amazing things over there. As I mentioned, there's uh, Emma Coburn, Molly Seidel are both their athletes and those two are doing very well off their products, um, which is really cool to see. They've got, they put a lot into their YouTube channel. I encourage you to go check that out, but you can primarily go to livemomentous.com and use code TINA for 20% off. Also want to thank Athletic Greens. Remember my friends in Canada and Europe, you can also get this special offer of a one year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2 by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. And finally, thank you to Gooda, my favorite sunglasses. I have so many pairs of these and I, you'd be hard pressed to come across a day where I'm not wearing them or even a moment where I'm not wearing them. You can go to gooda.com, that's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash Tina, and it will take you straight to my page, or you can use code Tina15, and both of those will get you 15% off your order. So go to gooda.com forward slash Tina, and you can go check that out. My friends, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you on Monday for another Together Run, and I look forward to seeing you next Friday for a regular episode. Thanks so much. I'll see you then.